just as a one, one meta, and then, well, not meta necessarily different, you could say, is, is that we're creating um, an environment where the information for the kids becomes relative. So if you're talking about nutrients and understanding that in natural science, it's not just your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, your NPK out of a textbook. It's actually on a device that they've made, they've put it together, programmed, and now that data that they're collecting out of it is actually relevant. And the most common buzzword at the moment of the show is integration, getting things to integrate with each other. Uh, for me, that's a perfect integration with math, for example, where you're taking the data that they've collected out of their sensor or their module, and then you're able to take that data in, in your math class and do data interpretation for your mean, medium, and mode, as an example. Hi, my name is Francois Nordia, and I am a super teacher. And this is Super Teachers Unite, the show that's all about motivating, inspiring, and supporting teachers. And with me today, I've got Joel Kaplan from Thought Africa. Joel, thank you very much for the opportunity to have thank this you. interview with you, man. Yeah, thank you, Francois. I love what you're doing. Thank you amazing. so much. Yeah, we're going to say thank you the whole day, which is awesome. Gratitude is amazing. We're currently at EduTech Africa at the Santa Convention Center. Um, I've pulled in to try and meet as many of uh, my friends and suppliers and network um, that I can. And we thought, you know what, there's an opportunity to shoot interviews for the show. So let's take it. I'm not sure what the sound quality is going to be like, but we're going to roll with it. And if we can use it, we're going to use it. But it's all about providing value for teachers. And as you know, the show is all about providing as much value to teachers as we can. So for the first five to ten minutes of the show, we are going to spend, Joel is going to assist us in sharing what he think is the most valuable tips and tricks or thoughts or philosophies that would really be valuable for teachers. But before we do that, let's educate. Right, Joel, the floor is yours. Please tell us, what would you reckon would be valuable for teachers to know? So, I was thinking about this question just now, prior to the interview, and I actually only just realized that the most value for teachers right now is, uh, and what we're going to create and put out very soon, is free content, free resources, uh, things that you're able to do in and around your classroom and with your students that don't cost any money, where you're not constricted by budgets or you're not constricted by your management within your school, or any ad administration around it. So that, that makes sense because one of the biggest issues in schools is budget. If you want to do something innovative, the question is always how much is this going to cost? So when there's free right. when there's free resources and free things that we can start implementing in our classroom, teachers are all ears. So please, please tell so, us more. So, so for one, one example, we've got a project where we do upcycle bottles with vertical garden and some other cool things. Um, and that's free. We tell the kids to bring some bottles along, we go outside, they grab some vegetables or some plants. You may need to buy some seedlings, which are like 50 cents each. I'm sure the parents can do that. Um, Google see us first for coding. Totally free. You can get badges, passports, and a certificate at the end of it. Uh, there's a game called Boats by Tangible, which is a coding game as well, where you take a photo of a tangible uh, marker or a beaker, which essentially you go collect plastic out of the ocean. Um, and these kind of Free, freely accessible resources are there. Not often do teachers get that opportunity to explore the internet, to find everything that they want to. So I think as service providers to schools and uh, educators, we should start actually showing them, hey, this is what you can use as an alternative to this. I agree with that and I really like that concept. I want to take us a few steps back, back to the food gardening that you, that you spoke about. One of the biggest issues we have in the country and worldwide is that of food security. Yeah. Um, it's becoming, because of climate change, because of overpopulation, it's getting more and more difficult to feed everybody in the world. So one of the unlocks is to allow people to grow their own vegetables. For sure. So uh, essentially what we've done is, is um, as a company, one of our biggest uh, objectives is to make things accessible. Uh, so we believe in Africa, there's, the creativity exists, the drive to want to get things done is, uh, done is exists. But people think that a lot, like hydroponics for example, it's difficult or it's complicated and it seems like it's out of reach and that's our biggest goal right now is to give those resources available, make them available for free so that people know how to build their own. So at the one that we've got at our stand, it essentially has some fish in it. They're goldfish but they should be tilapia which get a bit too big uh, for the stand purposes where the fish are essentially providing the nutrients to the, the plants. And that's amazing. So, so just, just take us a step back because I don't think everybody would know what hydroponics is. So can you give us a quick, like just a, 
a low level, high level discussion of what what is hydroponics. Hydroponics is essentially growing plants um, mainly in water, so the hydro side of things. Uh, hydroponics can be a mixture of using soil and the water within like a gutter type of space. Uh, so you don't need to use a traditional farming method of going straight into the ground. Uh, so you can use a gutter, you can use an old coke bottle. Um, there, there's people that set up huge systems in warehouses so that you can actually have the farm closer to the city and then you exclude uh, your transport costs um, straight to the consumer. So what I saw at your stall is you've got you've got the vegetables growing in the hydroponic system yeah. and water is filtered through what is essentially a fish tank and the fish that's in there would eventually grow and it would be big enough for you now not the goldfish that you have in your yes. stall but if it's tilapia it's, it's a fish that you can slaughter and eat. So the idea is, is that you create a bit of an ecosystem um, and then what we've done is, is uh, we've plugged in this electronic module where you can monitor what's happening within your fish system and what's happening with your plants um, and that's something for the kids to do with a bit of coding and electronics. But now the nice thing is how that integrates so well in the natural sciences curriculum that in grade four for instance we're already working with uh, what plants need to grow and the typical model is that you have a vegetable garden you plant in soil but you can change concepts so well when you start introducing you know what let's see what happens if plants grow in water you're already including things like uh, food chains and um, ecology all in one little system but, but just as a one, one better and, and well not better necessarily different you could say is, is that we're creating um, an environment where the information for the kids becomes relative. So if you're talking about nutrients and understanding that in natural science, it's not just your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, your NPK out of a textbook. It's actually on a device that they've made, put it together, programmed, and now that data that they're collecting out of it is actually relevant. And the most common buzzword at the moment at the show is integration, getting things to integrate each other. Uh, for me, that's a perfect integration with math, for example, where taking the data that they've collected out of their sensor or their module and then you're able to take that data in, in your maths class and do data interpretation for your mean, medium and mode as an example. Which is awesome because relevance is so important. When I do workshops with children, I always ask them what's the biggest challenges that they are seeing in their own schooling and one of the biggest themes that comes out of that is this concept of relevance. Why am I learning what I'm learning? And it's the classic Simon Sinek, wow, how, what equation? I don't know if you watched the, the YouTube or the TED talk. Uh, so for us, we actually try to adopt that principle when we are part of what we teach or give in our resources. This is uh, making sure they understand why we've put this together for them to engage with, how they're going to go about it, and then what they're actually going to do. So that's a very nice framework to use. Just repeat that. Why, how, how, what? what? Why, how, and, what? and the reason is why is so that the learners connect, connect on a belief system. The how is so that they understand what they're actually going to end up doing, and the what is the actual product that they're, that they're going to be working on, the outcome. Which is which is absolutely imperative if you want to create engagement for learners. Because the other challenge that teachers are facing is classroom discipline. We we see all the negative news. Um, we see all the negativity, but we hardly see any of the positive things that's happening in our classrooms. Yeah. And having children engage in the content and in the activities that they do is one way of negating bad behavior or um, uh, challenges with discipline in the classroom. Not just that, uh, from, from the onset of the, the lesson or the engagement around it, they know what they're going to end up doing uh, by, by the end of the lesson, so it works out with them so that they're not uh, lost or confused and if they do get lost or confused in the way they at least know what the end goal is and uh, they can make some adjustments as they go along. I, I think in the, in the few minutes we just spent there's already a lot of value that teachers can take from this discussion but I want to I want to sw uh, swing or pivot the conversation a bit and talk about you Joel what's your origin story where do you come from and why do you have this vested interest in education? Sure. Uh, I'm going to make it very blunt. Go for it. So, 23 from Durban, a small town called Morningside, went to a school called DBHS. Uh, the entrepreneurial journey for me started when I was about nine, selling city sherbets, and then which moved on to uh, supplements for the, the rugby players. Okay. Um, so, that's where the entrepreneurial side came from. And uh, at the time at school, 
I had a an old grandpa who lived in the um, garage underneath my block of flats that I stayed in, and he used to tinker and build and create and make. And that's where I learned the majority of what I know today. And while I was at school, I'd spent every moment trying to get out so that I could either go to the garage or go and do something with my computer or something a little bit different. Uh, which was kind of strange because I subsequently just landed straight back into the, the school world. But the main uh, priority of why I'm in education uh, is because my understanding is, is that Africa is extremely ripe with resources, creativity and the willingness to learn. And that's, that's the key, is, is people actually have that willingness to attempt something, uh, to try something new. And for me, I feel like the access to the information is not quite there yet. Uh, so for us, or at least as accessible as it could be. So for us, we're trying to make uh, our stuff as open source. Um, we're trying to encourage other open source information. So yeah, and our journey is essentially education in, in Africa, not necessarily just in an independent private school or whatever the case may be. Yeah, which is very important because we typically see the entrepreneurial space focusing on private schools because they've got the money to pay for products and for services. Yeah. Where in the, the public system, it's not always the case. In, in many cases, parents have to fund extra and externally if we want to have innovative um, uh, activities coming into the school. So I think that's very noble and, and be very valuable to have that type of access throughout our entire schooling system. And, and, as an educational service provider and an entrepreneur and fundamentally uh, sometimes involved in business, you end up becoming a part of a particular band of businesses uh, and we would fall under the education category. And what I'm actually trying to do is drive that perception away from the education category and we're trying to create what I would like to believe a community of thinkers. Uh, and to play on our logo or our, our name, I mean, is creating thought leaders in Africa. Uh, and I think that's really imperative. If you look at the likes of the Elon Musk, Bill Gates, um, and so on, so forth, all the big names, just not just because they have a lot of money, but they thought completely different, um, and, and they, their thinking methodology was completely separate from the conformed methodology that 99% of people have. Yeah. And I think it's really time for all of us to start becoming more conscious and aware of our uh, decisions we make and how it affects other people, whether it be buying vegetables that are, you know, like you see. Sorry, Woolworths, but you see Woolworths will wrap bananas in plastic, and a banana has a natural plastic wrapper plastic already. around it. So it's been making people more aware of those kind of things. And not just on the sustainability side of things, uh, on the tech side, it's trying to combine the two. How do you use that tech to, to aid the sustainability? And I think there's a, there's a great movement at the moment. I think it's still not where it should be, but the environmental awareness um, is is getting some some uh, some steam. I think relevant now. Greta Thunberg that went through to the UN. Um, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to ask you what do you what is your thoughts? I love it that you ask me that. Good. I think you can talk and scream all you want, but if you're not executing and actually doing, then you're just you, you're actually just as useless if you think about it. So strike all you want, it's great to get the awareness out there. I think it's awesome that uh, Greta has managed to get so many people together. That's been absolutely amazing. Uh, amazing public speaker, but I would love it if she could start encouraging school kids to actually start adopting uh, the habits and the lifestyles around living more sustainably. I do think, I do think that's, the, that's, the, that's the intent. Um, it moved into this, 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 uh, this movement which I think a lot of people would buy into purely for the fact that, you know, on Fridays we're not going to go to school. So getting yourself out of school, that's one of the mechanisms to get you out of it. But once we start seeing these people adopting in their lifestyle things that's going to be environmentally friendly, if we all start minimizing our carbon footprint and we take that responsibility, then we start seeing the change. And I agree with you. It's important that there's a voice for that side as and there is a voice on the other side. She is absolutely perfect for that person. But in my what what I would say is you've got the people on the one side of the spectrum making the noise. I'm glad Greta and the movement and all the other environmental movement is there to make the noise. But we also have the climate change deniers and everybody else on the other side making noise and trying to fight them. It comes down to the individuals, the rest of us, who fall somewhere else on the spectrum to really start acting and realizing that this is for me but also for the following generations yeah uh, i 
I laugh a little bit because you're right. There are two polar opposites and extreme extreme opposites. And they are extremists in some uh, regard. And I like the, the analogy of the before or the reference to how we fall in between the two, the two of them. And if we could actually get both parties to participate in these kind of activities, which are fun as well, building a hydroponic system or adopting something, it's not necessarily a, a grudge a kind of purchase or activity. True. And I think it comes down to, in many cases, knowing what scientific literacy is. If people understand what science really is and what sci the method of gaining knowledge, yeah. people would start to understand, okay, this isn't just some Illuminati or conspiracy of scientists together trying to sell us hocus pocus. Yeah. But that the way in which the knowledge is gathered is really robust and comes over a long time. I think just to touch on a, something completely different, and I heard someone speaking about this the other day about how education is actually really, it's in you more than anything. Like, uh, you've got to be willing to want to self educate, willing to want to, to learn. And for me, I think that's an extremely important element to everything that we've seen going on around us is, is that um, there are people that are out there that prefer to just stay in a box and go through the motions week by week, month by month, year by year. And in that, I don't know, which is, you know, I guess a personal preference, but I think we need to all start self reflecting a little bit more about what are we doing that is educating ourselves just a little bit more. And the thing is, we naturally do that. We are children, we are naturally curious, we enjoy learning, but we don't know that Every we're learning. It's a science experiment when you're a kid. Exactly. Pick up an egg and throwing it on the floor is a science experiment. It's just going through the hypothesis, testing it, and trying to get results, and then changing your concepts based on that. So, as we age and as soon as we get to school, it's almost that, that, that natural curiosity is taken away from us because you're told, sit here, color in with that pencil in these lines, and you, only, you can only do it this way. Sit in a row. Exactly. Which is not, it's not conducive to the human spirit. So I, did, I couldn't conform to that. And uh, I never managed. I was constantly kicked out of class or school, uh, suspended. Uh, eventually, I got to a point where they suspended me, but I had to sit at school on a desk, but just outside of the classroom, more like a humiliation. But what's really surprising is, is if I look at the results that I've achieved so far, it's nothing to do with, with my education at school. And I, I love for this one of teachers to actually understand that what they were doing in the class at the time for me was um, uh, rubbish. Yep. And I never had ADD or ADHD. And when you could have quickly been stigmatized or diagnosed, like people say, like, oh no, he's a, he's a naughty child, he's got ADHD, like many teachers are currently doing. And with many parents, and I think it's a topic for a whole other video, but just over-medicating children. Just like, well, we, we don't know how to deal with the curiosity, so let's it's medicate. It's convenient to medicate. It's convenient to go to Woolworths and buy something that's in the plastic. I mean, it's, you know. And we all like our creature comforts and we all like convenience. But to, what's the cost? What is the long-term cost to the individual if we, treat, if we treat every single child in the class exactly the same way? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what it is. So, there's, so the, the type of activities that you do in your company, the creating of maker spaces, is an ideal um, way of letting children explore their creativity and, and also collaborate with each other. Uh, that's been so it's been it is so it is great it's uh, it's great for the exploratory purposes it's great for them to be able to do what they want to do rather than what's dictated more recently in the, the latest maker space we finished we put a breaker space which is a common term as well uh, so essentially old tech old computers old things take it apart put it back together and that's a really great way to explore but the one comment because uh, i assume most of your audience are teachers is, is i constantly hear this so where's the curriculum? Yeah. Uh, what's the curriculum look like? Let's go through it, etc. I'm like, well, no, there's, there's no curriculum. It's the fundamental basics of all the tools. It's the health and safety around the classroom. And then for me, it's around creating, uh, for example, the hydroponics that we keep on going back to that. But it's, this is the project. We're designing and creating a hydroponics set. The tools you have available are X, Y, and Z. So it could be a 3D printer, laser cutters, electronics, um, etc. Here's a little budget for you to work with it. Let's go. And they can, the kids must opt to choose to go with the Coke bottles and recycle it or upcycle it. It's, so uh, the, it's the child's choice. Well, it should be. And I, as much as I'm seeing teachers adopting it and they, they are shifting the mindsets and stuff, I see it's also very easy to fall back into old, old 
habits um, and just prescribe something. I more recently ran a course where it was upcycled vertical gardens with Coke bottles. And when I got the kids going, I did the whole why, how I I showed a video with Greta Thunberg for stripes and so on. And Paul did it, they all executed. Um, I'm going to share some photos that we need to share with your community. Yo, please. And one of the parents came up to me after our workshop and she said, um, I think next time it will be better if you get a picture of the, the, the product that they're supposed to make and then they make that and then at the end and then, I, uh, uh, and then they make that and that's the end. And I said, well, like, where's the creativity? Where's the fun? That's not different. That's, that's a recipe. That, and if, if you do that at the end of the day, sorry if you're driving, it's, it comes down to following a recipe and designing a product like we would have done in factories. Because that, yeah. that is the typical old way of thinking about education. Is we need to train factory workers. Follow the following recipe because we want a specific product. And it's still pertinent in 2019 in our classrooms. Yeah. So Joel, the final part of the episode is always me asking some, I call it like quick fire questions, but then we end up talking about a lot of it. Anyways, it's not that quick. Let's just call it fire questions, right? So you've got no idea what questions are coming your way. It's totally spontaneous on the spot. So first thing that pops up in my mind. No, we won't because we want the authentic experience. Okay, good. What would you reckon is your superpower? Okay, we're gonna have to yeah. start again. No, no. 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 Think about. I'm okay, not, I got it. I got it. Okay, got cool. It. Okay, connecting people. All right. So, tell me about this connecting people. Why do you reckon it's your superpower? So I'd rather look at someone's not necessarily the knowledge that they have and why it would be relevant to the other person, but the values that someone will have in their belief system. And you see that as a common element of two. I introduced you to a man from a school earlier. I think you two will get along. So I like that because I believe that's my superpower as well. Like networking, being, being able to put people, like-minded people together. So that, because you know what the, what the greater challenge is? And how these two people together are going to solve those those challenges and together? Within, then it's a different knowledge. Maybe they get to be powerful. So we've already spoken during the interview a lot about the negatives and the things that we see in education that don't really we don't really like. But what is there in education that you find very positive? Sure. It's difficult to try and find it because we're so. When you talk about education, you need to be. It's a very broad question. So whatever you do, I'm supposed to go. Quick fire, it's supposed to be like No, but it doesn't matter. It's a very broad question. You're talking at schools and universities, self-education, like you're asking what's the most important thing. So what, what typically happens in these interviews is that the first thing that pops up in your mind is the thing that, that's most pertinent and valuable to you. In education. In, so if you if I say the word education, whatever oh, okay, you got did, it. I'll spell it out for you. Go. G O O G L E. Good most valuable thing in education. It's free, it has all the resources that are relevant and available and one needs. And there are so many teachers that are already embracing it, but it's so difficult for the majority to take the time and find the time to go and really look for these resources. So they end up going back into the typical textbook style of teaching and the, the, the rote learning and stuff like that. So it's ingrained in them difficult to to um, really incorporate these innovative ideas that you can find yourself on Google but I think the positive that I've seen is that there are teachers there are super teachers in every single school I'm convinced about it that want to make a positive difference do you not think every teacher is, is a super teacher bear with me okay because I know you get those outliers that are just absolutely amazing um, but they everyone that went to go study teaching Correct me if I'm wrong, they started with a passion no. to want to go and do this. They didn't. And, and I can say it with a lot of confidence. I know you can. So Because we've got the research on this. 51% of teachers wanted to become teachers. I know we can't extrapolate the data. It comes from the Teaching and Learning International Survey. But in South Africa, one out of two teachers surveyed, it's two and a half thousand teachers, so you can't extrapolate. But roughly, Half of the teachers in the education system didn't want to be teachers. The other half started teaching uh, because they wanted to. Typically what happens, teachers, uh, it's an easier degree to get entrance to. Um, you, you graduate, you get into a school because that's a, a, a salary. At the end of the day, that's one way of ensuring that you so get a salary. My, my, what I was going to ask was, is they started with a passion which turned into something 
Yeah. Well, even if they started the teaching thing without actually having a passion for it, do you not think it could have subsequently been developed if all of the administration around teaching wasn't logging the teachers down? If you speak, if you speak to any teacher, they'll tell you that the workload we have, the curriculum constraints, the admin is killing our passion for teaching. Yeah. So, um, what is um, what is cool though is that all these teachers that were surveyed, ninety-eight percent of them said. They've got a passion for people. They've got a passion to to uh, make a difference. So it's, it's essentially whatever comes from the top down, yeah, it breaks it down. It's the constraints within the system that really de demotivates a teacher, and that's why initiatives like this in finding the super teachers. To answer your question, I don't think all teachers are super teachers. There are very mediocre and average teachers. There are very poor and bad teachers. There are good teachers as well. My mission is to find the super teachers, share their stories openly, the positive stories, because there's a lot of negative. I'd rather share the positives so that everybody can see that's an ideal. That's something I want to strive towards and increase their practice and try and become better. That's why, that's why I'm shooting these interviews, is so that people can get access to the information, see which role models are in those poor country. teachers or those mediocre teachers become a super teacher? Of course, everybody can just as easily as super teachers can become poor teachers. Because yeah. technically, you're only as good as your previous lesson. What's your short fire number three? Okay, oh, they just pop up as they, as they come. Um, you've got no budget constraints whatsoever. You've got all the resources in the world. And you get to design a school. What would you do? How would you design your ideal school? Sure. There's a place called River Sands yeah. Always. Yes. And I was thinking about it the other night that this could make an absolutely awesome school. Okay. Uh, it's got a massive agri hub for agriculture. It's got an amphitheater. It's got lecture halls. It's got these little like uh, 50 square meter or 100 square meter units that are in there. And you could do amazing things across all these units. You wouldn't have classrooms. You wouldn't have uniforms. You wouldn't have a school song. It would be purely a place to come and explore. Uh, it's open. It's um, Okay, I'll, I'll definitely go, go through. Google it. I'll, I'll come it. through yeah. and visit you there. You go, come and see what it what it looks like. But it sounds ide ideal. Uh, uh, ideal. And also, with I think uh, what should be incorporated in all with kids is, is animals, chickens, fish, goats, all of the rest. I think that they should be exposed a lot more to to farming and type environments. Awesome. And then my last question: Tell us about your favorite teacher. My favorite teacher. When you was at school. You was, that's excellent English. You can see my English data is running out again. When you were at school, who was your favorite teacher and why? You don't have to mention names if you don't want to, but like, tell us about your favorite teacher. You're going to have to ask me the question again because you're going to have to edit this video, but I genuinely don't have a single like, a favorite so, teacher. No, so he wasn't at school. Okay, was, so now I, I did my apprenticeship so, when I was at school, but not my teacher. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the question again, but I'm gonna keep the previous. I just think your voice was too low for the camera to pick it up. But suddenly you went like, "Oh shit, I don't have the no, right I answer." Said, oh, shit, because like these teachers could be watching this, and, like, which is fine. Oh, oh. It's it's important for me that people understand yeah. that but we all have favorite teachers, teachers that really um, this they, is they, a role model. they make they make an impact in your life, and these teachers do not necessarily have to be in school okay no, no, so so i'm going to ask it again but i'm not going to roll the footage anyway um tell me about your favorite teacher so i had an old scottish man an engineering he was an engineer by trade he used to tinker with all sorts of amazing things whether it was a, a bidet for his um, infinite wife at the time had a stroke whether it was a mobile scooter that she could ride so she could get uh, all terrain so like dirt road or in a shopping center and he used to build and tinker and that's where I got my inquisitive kind of uh, mind from this is from him uh, an old Scottish engineer and it's somebody that was outside of the school area 100% out of the side of the school area so he used to call me uh, he used to say that I was on an apprenticeship I was too young for a formal apprenticeship uh, he used to say that I should be paying him all the knowledge that I was gaining and everything I was learning. But he would phone me at 2 o'clock in the morning and say that there's been a fire at this point uh, or a little electrical fault at the one place and uh, we have to go through to rewire it. And all I would do is hand him the, the, uh, the meter, the volt meter, the DVD, or hand him a particular screwdriver, 
it's never allowed my hands in my pockets because that means I was doing nothing. Yeah. Um, and he was one of the greatest teachers and uh, role model. Which is amazing. Joel, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, interview you. I think there's some great nuggets of information that we got in this interview. If you like what we do here, you like these type of edit episodes, please like, subscribe, follow, share on all the different platforms. I would really appreciate that. And let's ensure that we motivate, inspire, and support teachers so that they can make a positive difference in each and every classroom. Until next time, my name is Franz Wonodier. This is Joel Kaplan, and we are Super Teachers.